Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vandersee, and today we have our old friend, Mr. Anthony Amadeo, back on the podcast. Anthony, welcome back, brother. Thank you for having me, Bart. Nice to see you again. Yes, yes, this is really cool, because uh, you you do some extremely, um, really important research for drum history in general, but pr- particularly your... Um, you're a Rogers guy. I think that's that's very very uh, clear when when I talk to you and even your background now in the video. You've got Rogers everywhere. It's everywhere, and I love it because Rogers, the history needs to be kept alive. Um, so, but today we're talking about Ellis Tolan, truly a prolific guy. We're going to hear all about him today. I mean, he's the definition of an un- unsung hero and someone who deserves a lot of credit. So we're going to learn all about this. He's, he's really a drummer that everyone should know about. So this is going to be a great episode. But before we do that, let me do a quick Patreon shout out. Um, I want to give a mention to Matthew Brown, who joined at the upper tier, $15 a month, um, and he gets a shout out on an episode. So he wanted me to mention that he just started a uh, new band. It's called AOM or Ohm, I think. I'm sorry, Matthew. I think it's something like that. AOM uh, it says it's a brand new band just starting out. Band consists of 25 members from all over the world. And he says they're getting more. Um, so who knows? You might be listening to this and soon you'll be a member of uh, AOM because they just keep getting new members. So uh, thank you to Matthew Brown for joining the upper tier. If you want to get a shout out, you can uh, go to patreon.com slash drum history podcast, join there. You also get your name at the end of the episode. So all that being said, Anthony, I am very excited for this because you always do such um, incredible research and have such great topics. So let's jump in and tell us all about who Ellis Tolan is. Absolutely. Well, first I want to say, as you mentioned before, and as you know, I'm a Rogers fanatic. And um, I guess you could say a bit of a historian of all things Ohio era Rogers. And over the years of doing my research on Rogers drums, this name kept coming up, Ellis Tolan. But it was always sort of like a footnote or an afterthought. You know, you would be reading things and it would say, the Dinosonic snare drum, Joe Thompson, and then somewhere at the bottom, you know, Ellis Tolan. So I'm thinking, who is this guy? And I would ask people who I would figure would be in the know. And the answer I always got was, oh, he was involved with the development of the dinosonic snare drum. So I'm wondering who he is. So I I do what all of us would do is I go to the internet and surprisingly, there's virtually no information on Ellis Tolan on the internet. Like if you Googled Ellis Tolan right now, what comes up is videos from my YouTube channel and (laughs) and virtually nothing else. I mean, there might be like an old Philadelphia article that he was mentioned in and whatnot, but I quickly realized that I'm going to have to dig deeper. So I started to join Philadelphia, like vintage Philadelphia Facebook groups and things like that and would reach out and see if anybody knew Ellis. And I got a couple people that would jump in and say, oh, I, I, I bought my first drum set from Ellis and this and that. But there was one person who contacted me and I can't remember who it was at the moment, but they said, you know, Ellis's son is on Facebook. So I find him, Donald Tolan, and I reach out and he gets back to me, wonderful guy. And, um, you know, he says... He tells me like these really great stories about his dad and gives me a lot of information and uh, sends me some photos. And he says, you know, you should really contact my my older brother, Bobby, who worked at the stores and stuff like that. So I get in touch with Bobby Tolan. And over the past year or so, I've developed a a great uh, phone relationship with Bobby Tolan. He's, He's a great guy. And he's told me a lot of hilarious things about his dad and working at the store with him and all that. And he gave me a lot of really great pictures, most of which we're going to look at today. Uh, but he suggested, you know, that I should talk to some of his dad's friends. So I reached out to a man named Alan Fogel, who knew Ellis really well. And Alan was sort of a legend in the vintage drum world. And he had some really great stories about Ellis that I hadn't heard before. And now also gave me some pictures. And Bobby also led me in the direction of a man named Dick Cully, uh, who was a friend of Ellis. If anybody doesn't know who Dick Cully is, I definitely recommend looking him up. He's an incredible yeah. drummer and uh, was a friend of Ellis. And actually he um, sent me this photo right here. Yeah. Uh, that's Dick Coley Which, with Max Dick Roach. Dick Coley was like pr- protege of like Buddy Rich or something as well, wasn't I, he? Or there's some connection there? there? There's definitely a Buddy Rich connection. He kind of like plays very much in the style of Buddy Rich and, and kind of built his career on that, I guess you could say. Yeah, sure. But I think this is a photo is from probably the mid 90s. Dick Cully, Max Roach, and Ellis Tolan. And Max and Ellis, as we're going to talk about, just go back decades. So that that's a pretty cool photo there. Yeah. Um, so when when was Ellis? You might have said this already, but when was he born? Like, what was his... He, he was born in 1923. Oh, okay, okay. 
Bobby also led me in the direction of a man named Jack McCarthy, who is a brilliant Philadelphia jazz historian, and he filled in some of the gaps, and all of this kind of started to come together. But the most valuable piece that I uncovered was this phone interview with Ellis done by a woman named Suzanne Cloud. And Suzanne Cloud is a Philadelphia jazz musician and Philadelphia jazz historian. And actually her and Jack McCarthy, they both run the Philadelphia Jazz Legacy Project, uh, which everyone should check out, which is awesome. And she granted me access to this two-hour phone conversation that she had with Ellis in uh, one phone call was from December of 2000. And the other one was from January of 2001. And when I heard this, the floodgates just kind of opened hearing him tell all these stories. And with her permission, I'm actually going to publish those interviews in entirety on my YouTube channel for everyone to access easily and and to hear Ellis tell a lot of the stories we're going to talk about today. Um, and, and, And believe it or not, it's the only known recorded interview with Ellis Tolan. But there was wow. another one done with uh, a previously mentioned Alan Fogel, but those tapes have mysteriously disappeared. Alan said he about 20 years ago, he lent the tapes to someone to transcribe, but they never gave it back to him. And he doesn't remember Jeez. who it was that he lent it to. So if anybody knows where the Alan Fogel, Ellis Tolan tapes are, please contact me. Um, Man. But what I'm getting at here is I went into this just simply looking for more of the Ellis Tolan Rogers connection. And what I came away with was this guy has lived an incredible life. I mean, he was an outstanding jazz musician. He knew all the great players of the day and was dear friends with them. He basically invented the drum clinic. He had a swing club above his music store that was incredibly important within the jazz scene in general. He played an enormous role in Rogers Rogers drums, elevating to the greatness that they did in the 1960s. He owned one of the most successful music stores in the country, played on hit records. I mean, this guy is like unsung, unsung legend of drumming yeah, and jazz in general. So I figured what a better platform to shine some light on the name Ellis Tolan than the Drum History Podcast, right? So, Well, I agree. And, and you know, to be to go back. So I, I recently did something about the, the drummer who was with playing with Hitchcock on the film. Yes, and it's like and I mentioned great. in that that like I just love that like information. I feel like it has to be out there somewhere right. and you are proving that of like you know it's like you just go digging and then you find this interview and you talk to someone where it's it's not easy to find no. but if you dig and you find it then it's out there and there's like imagine in 50 years if you didn't do this this interview and get this stuff up on youtube and already do the work and do the presentations it would truly, I mean, it very well could be just completely lost to time. Totally. Which is such a shame. It so is. it needs to be documented. But I mean, before we move on, why do you think, because he's so prolific, why do you think drummers like Ellis, which there are others as well, who they sort of are unsung heroes? Like, why does it sort of get lost to time, do you think? I don't I don't know. I think maybe just because they weren't the big names that are sort of in the way. And even though he did play on some hit records, I don't think people got the credit. Yeah. Like physically on the record and even just the credit for being there back then because it was more about the artist. I mean, you hear about it all the time with Hal Blaine and Carol Kay and all those guys. They don't know who's on what record because they played on so many and the credits weren't there. So, I mean, things just get lost to history. And like you said, when you go digging, it's just everybody kind of tells the same broad story, but there's little pieces here and there that you pick out. Oh, I haven't had heard that before. Or I, nobody said this before. And you kind of just put together this little, this little puzzle that is slowly yeah. just deteriorating to history with people passing away and people's memories fading, you know, so it needs to be documented. And that's why, you know, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to celebrate Ellis Tolan's life and put, oh, put something down that will stay, you know, for history. Absolutely. It's the perfect kind of uh, uh, non, you know, I love the ones that are just kind of your more, uh, I don't want to say basic, but obvious choices of episodes. Mm-hmm. But this is a very cool one that you, you've come up with. So where do we go? Let's go deeper into all those. Mm-hmm. I mean, you mentioned so many things there. Where do you want to kind of dig like, in first? Well, I guess we could start from the, right from the beginning. Ellis Tolan was, yeah. was born in 1923, as I mentioned, in Philadelphia and grew up in the Philadelphia area. His dad was in insurance and uh, had to open up a gas station to kind of make ends meet through the depression. And Ellis knew early on that he wanted no part of that. And he claims that he was obsessed with drums by the age of two. 
And at the age of five, on a trip to Atlantic City, his grandmother buys him this little toy drum set that he destroyed the same day, which isn't hard to believe having kids, to be honest with you. So. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> um, yes. And a, a nice little nugget of information that his son Bobby gave me, he said in the 1930s, uh, as a kid, Ellis was a Duncan yo-yo champion. I guess Duncan, the toy company, had these yo-yo competitions, and Ellis became like the national yo-yo champion. Wow. And even into his old age, he would rip out the yo-yo and make it walk the dog and whatnot. <laughs> I just I just thought that was kind of funny. That's So talent, I mean, honestly, that's not that's not really drum related, but I feel like there's like a hand-eye coordination, dexterity, talent, sure. dexterity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Well, be, being a music and, and drum instructor, you could kind of see certain kids have a thing and then certain kids don't. So sure. the yo-yo thing certainly plays into that sort of thing. But at, at a young age, he claims that he decided he was going to dedicate his life to drumming. He didn't know he could make a living or not. He just said that I'm not doing this. I'm doing I'm yeah. doing this. So at 13, they finally get him drum lessons. And his first teacher was a guy named Jesse Altmiller, who was the show drummer for the Fox Theater in Philly. And then later on, another guy named Joe Hutland, who was the pit drummer at Carmen Theater in Philly. But these were all orchestral players. And Ellis was really into Chick Webb and Gene Krupa. And he wanted to play jazz. He wanted to swing, you know. So um, yeah. finally at 15, he gets his first real drum set. And he describes it as a slingerlin with a big bass drum, a Chinese tom-tom and temple blocks, trap tray, you know, the whole thing. Yep. And um, apparently excelled really quickly and started just right out of the gate working and playing, paying gigs. And then at, nice. at 16 years old, his life pretty much changes when his dad takes him to the Broadwood Hotel to see the Tommy Dorsey band. This is, I guess, 1939. And in 1939, the drummer of the Tommy Dorsey band was a young Buddy Rich. And Ellis tells the story that there was on the corner near the Broadwood Hotel, there was this little luncheonette. And before the performance, Ellis's father takes him to get something to eat. He said he even remembers getting a grilled cheese and a Coke. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. It does. <laughs> and so they're in there. Who walks in but Buddy Rich and his father? So a young Ellis. Oh, wow. You know, gathers up the courage to go over to Buddy. And he says, hey, Buddy, I love the way you play. I'd love to be your friend. And he said, Buddy said to him, who needs friends? <laughs> Tim, <laughs> he's tough even I, I then. guess the typical buddy response but ellis took it in stride and they went and they saw the first set of the performance and during the intermission ellis's dad took him back to the luncheonette to get a milkshake or whatever and who walks in again but buddy and his father oh, so man. ellis walks over to him again and he says buddy i'm really enjoying the performance and i could tell that you like chick webb and this time buddy looks at him puts out his hand and says friends and they were literally <laughs> friends ever since I mean, like, like family friends, like anytime Buddy was in town in Philadelphia, he would stay over at Ellis's place instead of staying at a hotel. And uh, wow. Ellis would visit him on the road and they knew each other's children and they were literally like family. I have a couple photos right here. This is the one of uh, that's Buddy out in front of the Tolan residence in Philadelphia. And oh, wow. under his right arm is Donald Tolan and under his left arm is Bobby Tolan. I mean, this this. Buddy was basically Uncle Buddy to them. I mean, he would stay over the house. Bobby tells me stories of how they would wake up in the morning on a Saturday morning or whatever, and Ellis would have to go open the store, and their mom would have to would be somewhere else, and and they would leave the kids with Buddy, <laughs> and and Buddy would take them down in the basement where the drums were, and 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 play drums and kind of like show them things. Bobby said he remembers sitting right by the hi hat and Buddy's playing and showing him things. Man. So he was over the house all the time. Here's one of. Uh, Buddy and his wife, Marie, at the Tolan residence just for a visit. Kind of cool to see these candid shots. You know, you see the old yeah. phone in the background there. Yeah. I feel like Buddy kind of famously was very like, like there was a wall that like, you, it was hard to get through. Sure. But once you did, he recognized very real, genuine people who weren't kind of just after autographs and stuff. And if my math is correct, you said 1935, but 39 would have been is like, where they met. I think Buddy was t okay. 20 and Ellis was probably 16. Yeah, yeah I yeah, think yeah, Buddy yeah. gets that reputation because of the bus tapes and all that. But I mean, I know, I know. From people who know him, he was obviously a really warm guy. Here's a cool picture of that's that's Buddy with Ellis's wife and Donald and oh, that's cool. Bobby's mom. He apparently called her Monkey, and you can see on the kind of on the top it says Monkey Love. <laughs> To monkey love buddy they were really like family it was like 
That's awesome. And um, it's a cool picture of of Buddy kind of hanging out at Music City, you know, looking real relaxed wow. in his hat there. <laughs> wow. And did you get these like family photos? I got these from... straight from Bobby Tolan. Yeah. This okay. is Okay. These are like family photos. Yeah, these aren't it's unbelievable. These aren't things you're yeah. you're going to find out out on the internet or anything like that. So yeah, he I mean, that 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 was a life-changing thing for him to meet Buddy that day and it and it really stuck, you know, when he said friends, he meant it. And they became lifelong friends. Um but, you know, okay, through that Ellis continues to play gigs around the Philadelphia area. And um, he's, he's using some, some really unique drum sets that I want to kind of show pictures of. I think you'd be interested to see this. If you look at this picture right here, and if I could kind of describe it to, to people who Please, are watching. Yes, this is unique. <laughs> I guess, I mean, the first thing I notice is there's no bass drum. And he has a snare drum, I guess, in the traditional position, a hi-hat in the traditional position. And where commonly you would see a rack tom is a set of bongos. And to his left, sort of above the hi-hat, is another floor tom. To his right, I guess in the traditional floor tom position, is another floor tom, but then one in front of it, which looks like a 20. And then above those is another rack tom. So it's this <laughs> really odd setup. I mean, would, would you say that's a good way to describe it? This is one of the weirdest looking drum sets I've ever seen. But, but it's really, really cool. But it's almost just like... Well, it had to maybe have a really specific kind of like use, like like a song that was like, or almost like it was set up for a video. Maybe, maybe. Here, here's another angle of it where you could kind of see, it looks like he's using what looks like a 20 inch floor tom as the yeah, bass drum huge with an tom. upbeat yeah. pedal. And he has the ET, his initials on the floor toms on the front there. Okay, yeah. yeah. And I think you could clearly see this is a, that this is a WFL set. Yeah. And then we've got a Tom on the far on the outside, but it's got like floor Tom legs on it that are up about as high as you could ever have a floor Tom. Right. Go. Right. You know what I mean there? Th this is, it's cool. I mean, I think it's, it's almost like kind of like that Daru Jones kind of like <laughs> biz bizarre setup. It is today. bizarre. It is bizarre. Here's a, a, another angle of that same set where he's playing the bongos with his hands and that, it, that, that symbol, it, it's almost like a, a, a precursor to the boom stand. It's really just like a bent straight rod. That's kind of a <laughs> yeah. unique thing. Yeah. And then you could really see how that rack Tom, as you said, has sort of a floor Tom leg attached to it with a bracket there at a cockeyed angle right. to make it level out. Like it's like almost like they planned like where it would need to be. Yeah. Where things would need to be bent, you know, and his mustache. I honestly, if I looked at that, I would, I would say that looks like, um, Walfredo Reyes Jr., his dad, Walfredo Reyes Sr., because of the, the little mustache yeah, and the glasses. The, the pencil line that, mustache that, that was yeah, popular. That, that at looks the time. like Wall, Wally's dad. Interesting, interesting. And here's a cool ad. It's a UFIP ad, I would say, probably from the 1940s. It says, A 14 inch UFIP symbol carries big as most 18s, says Ellis Tolan, drummer with Alvino Reyes Orchestra. So a cool little endorsement ad by for Ellis you know, early on as a young man. Yeah. Weird symbols. translation too. like Carrie's big as most 18s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 18s were considered big then, I guess. Yeah. So that's a yeah, cool yeah. ad. Well, here, and here he is on, on more of a traditional four piece drum set with a, with an actual bass drum. And what jumps out at me, out at me with this picture is the size of the rack Tom. It almost looks like a power Tom kind of bigger <laughs> than you would see most rack Toms of the era. I think. Yeah, beautiful drums and 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 such a dapper looking looking guy. And, and but it's so funny because like sometimes with the perspectives, he looks like almost like a little boy sitting behind a huge <laughs> drum set with right. these because it's like sometimes these photos, or, and then probably even the photo of the photo is like kind of bending up in yeah, the corners, yeah, which totally. makes him yeah. But that's really cool. And again, with his with his pencil line mustache, yeah, um, very cool. But you know, so he. He continues to play around and he and um, Stan Levy, the great drummer Stan Levy, who was also from Philadelphia and they were friends from from very young. He and Stan would hang out a play, at a place called the Downbeat Club in Philadelphia in the 1940s, which was a place owned by a guy named Nat Siegel, which a pretty popular place to play jazz around in the area. And that's where they had met Dizzy Gillespie for the first time. I guess Dizzy was in town doing a three-week residency. And Ellis says that when they first met Dizzy, his mouth was all busted up because he had just gotten in a fight with Cab Calloway. <laughs> so he could not some real. Yeah, yeah. So he couldn't play because his mouth was all busted up. But um, he remembers Dizzy saying to him, you know, you guys need to go to New York City and check out what's going on there. 
was at the time, I guess Ellis was explaining to him that in Philadelphia, all he was getting were society gigs, which is, I guess what you would call like dinner parties and weddings and, you know, yeah. playing society yeah. music. And Ellis wanted to play jazz. So, uh, and Dizzy said, you know, you got to check out what's going on in New York. And so at 18 years old, Stan Levy and Ellis Tolan moved to New York City and get right in the middle of what was the inception of what would become bebop, what was per- percolating in the underground in New York City. Hmm. And he said they got a penthouse apartment for $11 a week on 45th Street. And they immediately ran into guys like Charlie Parker, Max Roach, Thelonious Monk, Clifford Brown, Dexter Gordon, Bud Powell, Miles Davis. And all these guys were just young guys running around the city playing gigs. And here's a really cool picture of that Stan Levy behind Ellis Tolan's drum set. You can see the ET on the bass drum. Yeah. And on bass there is Leonard Gaskin. Um, you obviously have Charlie Parker on saxophone and to Charlie Parker's left is Miles Davis. And then to the far right, you have Dexter Gordon. And this is at the spotlight on 52nd street in 1945. So these are the wow. kind of guys that they were running with when they got to New York city. Excellent picture That's there. That's crazy. Cause now you, you think of it as like, these just untouchable jazz icons. But I guess then it's really more just like, you know, they're still legendary, but this is so early for everyone that it's just guys on the come up. Just to be able to get involved. Yeah, exactly. I love his logo too, the ET and the, he's basically got the, you know, the, the music symbols there. Right. Uh, you, you're you're the more learned than me. Yeah, yes, he's got the, the treble clef and the bass clef I forgot there. my music theory class. <laughs> yeah, and and it's hand-painted. That would Absolutely. be, goes back to that episode. Right, it's with totally Louis, hand-painted. Yeah. Yep. Totally. So these are the guys that they were running with there. And he said, you know, they would also play gigs with Ben Webster, Lester Young, Roy Eldridge. He said Sarah Vaughn. He even mentioned Harry Belafonte at the time was around New York City trying to be a jazz singer. And that after the gigs, all of 52nd Street would go back to Ellis and Stan's apartment because it was this big penthouse and they would all <laughs> just listen to jazz records all night. And you think about it, you know, like as you said, these weren't, it wasn't Charlie Parker yet and Max Roach. They were just kids in their 20s doing what they did, you know, just actually creating something, artists creating something. Must have been a really cool scene there. And though that, yeah. that went on for, for a few years until um, Ellis said that unfortunately everybody started to get hooked on heroin. Well, I was going to say, I get the image of like, yeah, this, this awesome apartment, you know, penthouse, New York City with Miles Davis and all these guys. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure they're not all there just like chewing bubble gum. Right, right. I'm sure some of these guys were up there. I mean, that's, but that's. So what was what going happened. on, that's, you know, they were. That's all, what happened. Yeah. And, he, you know, he, he said that, well, like he, he said that, you know, Stan got hooked and Max Roach and obviously Bird. And he said that, you know, everybody thought if they stuck needles in their arm, they were going to be able to play like Bird. But, um. You know, That's he said eventually yeah. Stan kicked it and Max kicked it, but you know, Bird and some other people unfortunately didn't make it. But he ended up because of that. He ended up uh, supporting Stan Levy financially and and having to pay the rent and everything. And he had to go back to Philly because he just couldn't be involved with things like that anymore after some years. So he goes yeah. back to Philadelphia and starts playing gigs back there again. I guess back to the so- society gigs or whatever. Um, yeah. But I should mention another life-changing incident when he was about 20 years old he would be playing and would get these sharp pains in his hands and he remembers mentioning to buddy one time say saying you know buddy how long do you have to play for before the pain in your hands sets in and buddy says what the hell are you talking about ellis so he knew you know something's going on here so he goes to see a doctor and the doctor does the x-rays and whatever they have to do and it turns out that he has osteoarthritis Oh, wow. At a very young age. And that's something that ran yeah. in his family. So um, it was obviously devastating to someone who's wants a life as a drummer. And, yeah. you know, and he's doing it. He's, he's doing successful. It. He, he's really doing he's, it. Wow. He's in the midst of it. And now he has this this issue that keeps him from playing really long periods of time. But he plays through it for a while and ends up on on bands like the Henry Jerome Orchestra, but is having trouble getting through some really long gigs and I guess widely wisely discovers that, you know, I'm going to have to devise another life plan and figures he'll go into teaching. So in 1947, he starts teaching and opens a teaching business with a business partner named Bill Welch. And they start what they call uh, 
the Tolan Welch Drum Studio. And they open a, a drum studio in the Wurlitzer building. This is the Wurlitzer building here. They were on the second floor. Wurlitzer was on the first floor. And I guess the Tolan Welch Drum Studio had the second and third floor. Um, hmm. And he said within about a month, they both had full rosters of students. Wow. So it, it took off pretty quickly. And all of these students ended up wanting to buy drum sets. So his plan alters and he says, okay, maybe I'll start also selling drums. So um, they start to sell drums and they change the name to Music City from Tolan Welch Drum Studio. And right off the bat, they get a WFL exclusive, which was a big deal in those days. Sure. And for anyone who doesn't know, what, what getting an exclusive means is the manufacturers would give certain retailers exclusive rights to sell their product in a specific region. So in the greater Philadelphia area, the only place you could get WFL drums was at Music City, which was yeah. a big deal. And that's going to you know, play an important part in this story coming up in a little while. That meant, and obviously, there's no internet, right? Duh, but there's no you can't order them. You can't. You got to go in and get it, and right. that is huge. And honestly, too, seeing the picture to describe for people, Wurlitzer, huge, massive sign on the side of it that says Wurlitzer is music, piano, organs, radios, records, according musical instruments. So he's almost like double dipping and getting basically a free. Obviously, it doesn't say his name mm -hmm. on it, but people are coming to that building for musical equipment. Sure. I need drums. Go upstairs. That's right. Kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. It's a good way to cool. put it. Sure. I didn't even think of that. So yeah, they're on the second floor of that Wurlitzer building, and they eventually turn the third floor into a performance room, which would eventually become the Swing Club. And um, as I mentioned before, Ellis would pretty much hold the first drum clinics ever for all of his students. He had access to all these players and would have them come in to talk to his students about playing jazz and playing drums. And it was exposure to all these great players, ask them questions and see them up close. He mentions having Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich, Ed Shaughnessy, Max Roach, Papa Joe Jones, Louis Belson, Art Blakey. And here's a picture of Louis Belson at one of those clinics. A young Louis Belson, probably you know, late forties, maybe early fifties there giving a drum clinic. Um, cool. And I mentioned that the third floor was a performance room and here's a picture of the, the stage there. And if you look at the top left of that sign, it says exclusive WFL dealer, obviously something they were very they, cool. They were very proud yeah. of. And that's, you know, like I said, it's going to play a role later. Another picture of that stage there, there's Ellis on drums and I think Ace Ace Tassone on bass and Billy Root on saxophone. But again, you could see the sign exclusive WFL dealer. Very proud of that. Yeah. There are so many flowers in front of that <laughs> stage in that one picture. So There's many flowers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's like nine huge overflowing vases of flowers. It almost looks like a funeral. I was just going to say something. that. Unfortunately, it almost looks like a funeral. <laughs> no, I know, oh, but very, very cool. But someone might, they, maybe they were just like, let's stage it for a picture. They, or uh, probably, probably. <laughs> very cool. Uh, but those drum clinics that I talk about, they would, they would carry on in the next Music City location, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And they started to call it the Drum Club. And here's like a, a little advertisement, drummers, drummers, drummers across the top. It's like, come see your favorite artists at the Music City Drum Club. And, you know, you could you could hear and see and try the best musical equipment available and all that. And uh, here's another drum club advertisement saying that, you know, you could come see Butch Ballard. And unfortunately, I can't tell who the guy under him is and the name is sort of folded over. But these are just some of the advertisements for the... Um, the drum yeah. clinics that would happen. And those clinics um, at at 1035 Chestnut Street in the Wurlitzer building um, would eventually become the Swing Club. And at this time, Ellis got very into educating the youth and bringing jazz to the youth. He wanted these kids to be indoctrinated in jazz. Because um, around this time, the Earl Theater in Philadelphia, which was an all-ages venue, closed. And there was nowhere for these kids to see jazz music. So he turned what were the, the drum clinics into a swing club. And there's a cool newspaper article here where that says teenagers take their jazz seriously. And you see Ellis with the band and some teenagers kind of looking on and it's date stamped December 7th, 1955. 
Hmm. And that's great. And that's, I mean, because jazz kind of got a with people doing heroin and getting hooked on stuff, it got sort of, you know, got a bad, a bad name. connotation, sure. but like to be like, no, this is a way to keep people. Uh, Cause now I think of it as such a, um, it's like fine art of music. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like in a way. And, 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 and it's cool that he, you know, uses it. He seems like such a nice guy. Totally. Very positive, cool guy. And when you hear him talk in those Suzanne cloud interviews, you know, he's just, just got so much charisma and you could tell he was probably an amazing salesman because he's got just really great people skills and a great communicator. And even in, in his old age, in that interview, he's just sharp as a tack. Yeah. Um, so he, he, he t- starts this swing club and he says that he would stay up all night making these flyers explaining what's coming this coming week. And they had it every Tuesday night at seven o'clock. And what happened last week here, you could see is advertising Max Roach is coming. And there's a picture of Max. And under that last week, Clifford Brown was here. Really cool to describe for people. It's like a collage. It's yeah. like nowadays there's like zines and stuff totally. and like DIY things. That's He's what it looks like. Exactly. Stuff and collaging. And it's like, Really, really cool. I, I think just you can see how much effort and passion and time he put into all this stuff, which it's awesome. I wish this stuff was still around. Sure. You know? Absolutely. And here's a cool picture of Max Roach on drums at the swing club. I think that's again ace to sewn on bass. And you could clearly see on trumpet is Dizzy Gillespie, the unmistakable cheeks. Yep. The cheek. <laughs> you can see that him and uh, Alfred again, Alfred Hitchcock, but those two and their cheeks. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Famous cheeks. <laughs> Great photo right there of those guys at the swing club. And here's another flyer again, like the zine collage advertising Horace Silver's coming. And on the bottom, you can see it's last week was Art Blakey and Lee Morgan. And he, he, you know, he put a lot of time into this, as you could tell. And this is another cool one right here. The swing club sessions, Miles Davis and his modern sounds this Tuesday, December 6th, 1955, 7 PM bring friends. So, you know, he was he was having the heavyweights come in and play this club. It was a it was a major part of jazz history here. Um, a woman named yeah. Ruth Price, who went on to found the Jazz Bakery, which was basically an institution in Los Angeles as far as you know the jazz community, got her start singing at the Music City Swing Club at 18 years old, and she all through her life always credited Ellis with you know giving her her start. And Lee Morgan, the great trumpet player, in his autobiography talks about how important Music City was for his development as a musician and how that's where he met Art Blakey. And you can see a picture here. Wow. There's Art Blakey on Ellis's drums at the Swing Club. And right in front of him is Lee Morgan. And next to Lee Morgan is Billy Root. And this is where Lee Morgan met Art Blakey. And they went on to make all those Jazz Messenger records together. So you can Unbelievable. Cl- clearly see how important this was to, you know, the jazz scene then. And then unfortunately there's the story of Clifford Brown, how he played his last performance at the jazz, uh, the music city swing club. And he had left that gig on his way to Chicago and unfortunately got in a tragic car accident on the, on the, um, the Pennsylvania turnpike and, and, oh, and wow. lost his life. But the last gig he played was at music city. And here's a, one of the, another one of those flyers saying that Clifford Brown will be there. And um, if you look at the last week section, how Buddy Rich is there, there's something kind of funny at it. It's just a bunch of pictures of Buddy. And the bottom picture is sort of a, a picture of Buddy standing at a microphone talking to the audience full of kids. And there's an arrow pointing to it. And it says, picture of Buddy saying nice things. <laughs> I, just thought, <laughs> I just thought that was pretty funny. And yes. many, many of the, the Music City Swing Club sessions were recorded. And unfortunately, those tapes have been lost to history. So if anybody knows where they are, you know, maybe they'll surface one day. There's actually a Clifford Brown record that is released that I believe you could find online that was recorded at Music City and has Ellis on drums. Um, mm. But a lot of those are are gone to history. And there's a, there's a great picture from an audience perspective here. You can see the kind of audiences that they were drawing at the Swing Club. Wow. I mean, this is like packed. Yeah. And this is the third floor. The third floor above the store. Wow. Unbelievable, man. This is so cool. And everyone, it's not like, it's different than now where like, if I go, I'm like, you know, all right, let me get a beer and stand around right. and kind of move. This is like, it's clinics. I mean, but it's not, it's bands, but it's, it's just different. Yeah, totally. And I think he yeah. was, I think he said he was charging 25 cents or 50 cents admission or whatever. And he was clearly, wow. you know, losing money on it. Cause he, you know, would have to print up all the flyers and all that stuff. And um, here's a cool music city flyer and 
sort of advertising the teachers that he had teaching there. It's kind of a, a small print, but he had Mike Goldberg, who was formerly of Benny Goodman. He had uh, Lenny Payton that was with Duke Ellington. And as I mentioned, Ace Tassone, all these guys who were, who were their teachers there. So when you got, when you went there, you know, you were getting some, some musicians who, uh, who were out there and really doing it teaching. So yeah. he was, he had a pretty great roster of, of teachers there. Yeah, really. And uh, well, back to the, the WFL thing for a second, I kept showing those pictures of the sign and, yep. rem- you know, mentioning how proud Ellis was to have the WFL exclusive. Well, what happened was um, Bill Ludwig ended up basically screwing over Ellis. And I figure um, instead of me telling the story, I thought maybe we could check out a clip from just a short clip uh, from the Suzanne Cloud interview and hear, hear Ellis himself tell the story of what happened. And this directly ties into the Rogers connection. So I guess we yes. could check that out. Right. Everybody sold Slingerland drums because Gene Krupa played Slingerland drums. And that's what the kids went for. Yeah, right. And we were selling uh, Ludwig drums. We had gotten an exclusive on it. And I don't know whether it was within the first year. Mm-hmm. We used to fix the drums up. They were so bad, I used to have to mechanically correct them and do this. And one of my students came in and asked me to fix his snare drum. And I started to fix it. And I look at him. I said, gee, you didn't buy this drum from me. Where did you get it? He said, A Street Music. Eddie Hirschman and his brother used to run the place. Anyhow, when I found out that they were buying it from A Street Music, and they were very close friends of mine also, mm-hmm. I called them up and I said, where did you get the Ludwig drums? And they said, from William F. Ludwig, of course. So I called up Bill Ludwig, and I said to him, Bill, I said, I'm supposed to have an exclusive in Philadelphia, and you're selling drums six blocks away from me. So what are you doing? <laughs> he says, we need more exposure. I said, well, I said, there's only one thing I can suggest. He said, what's that? I said, take a drum company and shove it. And later on, a guy named Henry Grossman walked in the store, but that's later on. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I was still burning from the Ludwig thing. Henry Grossman said, gee, Ellis, he said, we heard all about you. He said, I'd like to talk to you. He showed me some holders, Swivomatic drum holders. So how are they? How would you, what, what do you think they would do on the market? I said, gee, they're great. They got to sell. He said, I also bought a drum company. I said, what's the name of the drum company? He said, Rogers. Right. Said, gee, Rogers is, to me, is a toy drum company. I said, uh, oh, I said, I can't handle Rogers drums. He said, well, the reason we came to see you is is we want to know how can we take this drum company and make it the way you would like it. Right. And I said to myself, here's my chance to fix Bill Ludwig. (laughs) That's all I thought of. I didn't think like a businessman. Right. I thought like a drummer, right? Right. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, I'll show you how to build the drums and to make the best drums in the world. I'll get your Buddy Rich to play them. I'll get you Louis Belson. I'll show you how to do drum clinics because we had been doing drum clinics in the store, not in the store, in the studio in 1947. In 1948, we started doing drum clinics. Right. I said, I'll even show you how to build the best snare drum in the world. So I designed the Donny Sonic snare drum. Okay. Right? I never asked for royalties. My head wasn't in that particular. Right. All I wanted was for Rogers to now have the best drums on the market. And for them to give me an exclusive, right? Which they did, and Henry G- and Henry Grossman was a man of his word. He right. stuck by it all his life until he sold the drum company. Wow, <laughs> that was a lot of. Uh, it's so funny how just angry he got over it, and his main goal was to be like, sure. I mean, we all get that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Everyone gets that. Well, explain it. What are your so, thoughts? So, I mean, you heard that he gets screwed over by Bill Ludwig. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about the Dinosonic debate in the Rogers community, who developed what, who came up with what idea. And that's, you know, that, that's another story. But Ellis was definitely involved. I think he saw it as a great business opportunity, not only to get back at Bill Ludwig, but to have some creative control within a drum company that he could sell exclusively. I think that was his motive because he didn't get any royalties. Um, yeah. But, I, you know, you saw it as... Two things. I could get back at the guy who screwed me, and then I could have a great product that I have say in how how great it is. And sure, you know, there's you know, uh, talk about who was involved in what, but there is, you know, the, the great snowstorm story, which is um after that meeting at at Music City, 
Joe Thompson, engineer at Rogers, and Ben Strauss, uh, the marketing man and artist relations man, flew to Philadelphia to Ellis Tolan's home, and they were going to have a meeting on how to design this new this new drum that they were going to put out. And uh, they go down in the basement and they're devising their ideas. And I guess it was Ben Strauss who went to leave to go get some cigarettes and realized that there's a blizzard outside and they're not going anywhere. So Joe Thompson and Ben Strauss were snowed in at the El- at the Ellis Tolan residence for I think it was a day or two. And when they mm-hmm. came up from the basement, the design for the Dinosonic was apparently finished. And when talking to Bobby wow. Tolan, Bobby remembers this. I guess he was 10 or 11 years old at the time. And he said that he was particularly struck by uh, Joe Thompson. He remembers him specifically because he had on a a big belt buckle and cowboy boots. And you didn't see that very much around Philadelphia at the time, I guess. Yeah, no. But he also said that he remembers, uh, you know, when the men came up to get something to eat, he went downstairs and he saw all the sketches and drawings all over the table and ashtrays full of cigarettes and all that. Um, But... You know, according to his family and friends, Ellis Tolan's family and friends that I spoke to, um, Ellis had much more to do with the change in success of Rogers than just the Dynasonic snare drum. And I I don't want to ruffle any feathers in the the Rogers community, but you know, and don't shoot. It's like a don't shoot the messenger kind of thing. But um, you know, the years following Ellis Tolan's involvement a lot of major changes started to take place at Rogers and it's kind of no coincidence at meaning what they're suggesting to me are the things that changed post their visit. Um, the first thing was the bearing edges, the bearing edges. He suggested that they change from the kind of rounded over bearing edge of the early drums to the sharp 45 degree edge. And a lot of interviews Ellis talks about how a drum head su- should sit on a bearing edge the way the strings of a violin sit on a on the bridge so that was one of the things he brought to rogers and that's what changed actually with the development of the dynasonic the sharp bearing edge came and then also uh making the shell size an eighth of an inch smaller than the advertised size based on the leady floating head principle where leady would actually make their heads an eighth, eighth of an inch bigger so they would float on the edge he suggested that Rogers make theirs an eighth of an inch smaller to get the floating head principle, and yeah. this and to fit with traditional heads, right? Because so but the plastic heads were now becoming the thing, and they were yes. a one size fits all. You weren't going to be able yeah. to get the flexibility you would with a calf head. Sure. And this final thing uh, is not something I've I've mentioned publicly yet, uh, but again, don't shoot the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. Um, his friends and family are suggesting that it was Ellis who recommended that they change the lug design completely. Now, if I can explain, um, Rogers had what was called a bread and butter lug, a drawn brass lug that had a flaw under tension. It would crack in the corners. Rogers knew this. Everybody knew this. And yeah. Rogers was indeed redesigning the lug, but they were redesigning it to look like the old bread and butter lug, just a cast version that wouldn't break. I'm not suggesting that Ellis designed the lug. I'm saying that he went to Ben Strauss and suggested you need to completely change the look of the lug because people are going to come in. They're going to see this lug that looks the same and they're going to think it's the one that breaks and they're not going to buy it. Makes sense. So apparently it was Ellis Tolan who said you need to change the design completely. And Rogers went and designed the the beaver tail lug. Wow. Um, Obviously, there's no Mm. hard evidence or no paperwork. He got no royalties. But logic says, you know, he had a business investment in this. And obviously, he's going to want the best product to put out for his exclusive deal with them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. You don't have to be a lot of times with everything. There's not one person who does every single thing. Someone might walking down the hall suggest something and it goes into the final product. Totally. You know, I mean, it happens a lot. So yeah. so it seems un, uh, indisputable that he had large involvement in, in, in some cool things with Rogers. Sure. And the timeline meets up exactly, you know, where, where, yeah. where his meeting with them and then all of these changes start to play, take place in the coming years. In that video, sure. he also mentions how he brought Buddy to Rogers, which I totally believe because he was close with them since he's 16 years old. And I, yep. don't, I don't know of anybody at Rogers having a relationship with Buddy. So um, there's also another story that I want to tell real quick that my friend Rick Giles told me. That involves a man named Henry Adler. Henry Adler was a, a, a great educator and um, 
wrote a lot of drum books and he also had a, a music store in, in New York City. He actually co-wrote uh, Buddy Rich's modern interpretation of snare drum rudiments with Buddy. It yep. says, you know, he taught Buddy in collaboration with time. Henry Adler. Exactly. Yep. Um, and he said, he tells Rick Giles the story. They met up at a NAM show, I believe in the mid nineties and they got to talking about Rogers and Henry, Henry told Rick that Buddy came into the shop one day and he was like, what, what is this, all this Rogers I'm hearing about probably from Ellis or whatever. And Henry said, they're great. You got to check out this hardware. It's bulletproof. You know, he shows them the Swivomatic stuff, shows them the knobby brackets on the floor toms. And Henry told Rick that Buddy said, if I go over there and I jump up and down on that floor, Tom, and it doesn't collapse, I'll play Roger's drums. And Henry's like, no, no, Buddy, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> so apparently Buddy Rich went over and he starts jumping up and down on this floor, Tom, and it didn't collapse. And that <laughs> supposedly played, wow. a, played a role in him choosing Roger's drums. But that's Man. that's Fortunately, Buddy's pretty small. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. right. But I got a kick that's out of awesome. that story. Yes, so, yes. Um, Actually, at the Shields Classic Drum Show in Covington on April 27th, uh, Poe Shy and myself are going to have a sort of friendly debate about the Dynasonic, the two sides of the Dynasonic, I guess, uh, the Ben Strauss, Joe Thompson side of the story and the Ellis Tolan side of the story. I'm going to give a little presentation on Ellis, and then we're going to have a little friendly debate and give both sides of this Dynasonic story. But I think it's indisputable that Ellis was absolutely involved with the, yeah. the design. Yeah, totally. It's he it it worked out well that he had that arthritis in his hands. Sure. Not for him. I'm sure that was absolutely terrible. But really, I think the whole drum industry was better to have him on the inside as a, you know, with the clinics and the drum store and the and the, you know, just his knowledge. Sure. It worked out great. And I, you know, and I, I think I'm glad he I yeah. sorry to me to cut you off, but I, I, I think Rogers was lucky to have them because none of those guys totally. Uh, Henry Grossman, Joe Thompson, Ben Strauss, great businessmen, great engineers, brilliant guys, but none of them were drummers. So to have yeah. to have a, access to a guy like Ellis, who's been a drummer his entire life, knows the ins and outs of what drummers want. What you know, I think yeah. it was to their knows drummers. Like right. really, he's friends with these Absolutely. guys. Absolutely. So it yeah. benefited yeah. everybody involved. It benefited the people making the drums, and it benefited the drummers who were buying the drums to have Ellis involved. So absolutely, it all works um, out. So he, so no more WFL exclusive exclusivity. Obviously, that he kind of cut that off. I'm sure he probably stopped selling WFL at all after that because he was so burned. He did, yeah, and he went all yeah. in on Rogers. He was just, yeah. As we're going to see some pictures coming up here uh, in 1957, they moved to 1711 Chestnut Street. Um, Ellis said it was more difficult to get business on the second floor of the Wurlitzer building. So they moved to a street level storefront and business really started to pick up. And this was the store where the Rogers deal took place. And there's some great pictures that um, Bobby Tolan and also Alan Fogel gave me access to from 1711. And you could tell right here, there's, there's Ellis sitting in the store next to these beautiful Rogers drums. I mean, this yeah, just looks like a, a candy dream. store to me. <laughs> and he's proudly holding the Dynasonic snare drum, which he was very proud of, sitting in yes. front of a wall of snare drums. And you can see in the background, there's the cool tricks on kit with the odd bass yeah. drum and a, a, a shelf awesome. a shelf full of uh, practice pads and bass drum pedals. And just, I love this picture. It just looks like everything I want a drum shop to look like to me. Yeah, it's it's really cool. And the floor, just everything about it is very, you know, that that period in time. Sure. Um, just you just want to walk in. I'm, I feel like you can almost smell I was, what it looks you like. You took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to just say I could actually <laughs> smell this room. I, yeah. I love that photo. And here's another one kind of of the of the same room. And that's Ellis and his business partner, Bill Welch, kind of admiring the Dynasonic snare drum again, flanked by Rogers drums everywhere. He was he was, you know, as I said, all in on Rogers. Yeah, and he's got the symbols there in the racks. And honestly, holding the Dynasonic this much in the pictures and looking at it and let's get a photo with it even points further to like the involvement of him. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think he doesn't also, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy who'd be like falsely claiming something. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, the picture you have up now where he's pointing at the Dynasonic yeah. bottom going, basically, I did this. Check it out. Very <laughs> proud. I was involved with this. Yeah. Very yeah. proud. And I, I've... This picture right here that I'm going to pull up now, I've always wanted to know the story behind this. It's, I was going to say, do you know what's happening? There's like I would love two, to know. Two, are those dollar bills? Yeah, they look like fives and tens and singles. And 
It looks like there's three Rogers drum sets, and on every head, there's a, a set of bills. I don't know what this like represents. Two bills each. Yeah. Yeah. And Ellis standing there like, yeah, look at this. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm pulling in money selling Rogers. I don't know. I don't know what it means. And I've asked around. But the, nobody knows. But. Yeah, the two bill thing. Maybe he he had in his pocket a hundred dollars split up, and he divided it up, and each drum could get two bills. But it seems symbolic of like it does. But whatever. It's great shot. <laughs> it's just. It's probably in reality. It's someone being like, put some money on the drums because <laughs> yeah, no. you're doing so well. Yeah, nothing behind it, right? Yeah. And there's that wall of snare drums again, and all the sticks. It's just really great shots from this store. And there's a cool yep. shot of him in the store with Armin Zildjian, just kind of hanging out a young Armin. Yeah. And then, uh, very, very cool. There's, a uh, Ellis on the left with Ben Strauss in the center. And I don't know who that man is on the right. I've asked around. Nobody, nobody recognizes him, but I like this, like, and it's, it's happened up. It's happened before with like the Rob cook episode about like Frank's drum shop that like, these drum shops. And then there's these kind of like middle-aged men in business suits who are like at these drum shops. Like nowadays I think of like, like your hat, you have a wooden weather hat. Oh, or yeah. It's like Joe Absolutely. or like here, like Charlie at badges. It's right. like, they're more like younger guys yeah, totally. who are more like rock and roll sure. kind of guys. Like Jess at good these hands like, and all these young like guys. Jess, yeah. These are like business. Totally. These look like very, you know, yeah. Well, that was the suited up guy. That was the yeah. look of the day. Like if you went to a sporting event, now it's just people in jerseys. Sure. Back then, it was sure. suit and ties and fedoras. That's true. That's true. and these guys were going to work. Ellis got up in the morning and he was going to work. You know, so yep, very cool. So uh, around around this time, same time that seventeen eleven was happening, um, there was a, a record company in Philadelphia called Cameo, Cameo Parkway Records, owned by a man named Bernie Lowe. And Ellis was one of the session drummers for the label, played on records by Ruth Price, Donna Lee, Charlie Ventura, Clifford Brown. And probably the most important record that he played on came one day when he was in the studio, I think in 1960, and Bernie Lowe comes to him, the band, and says, you know, we're going to cover this song so that we could play it on Dick Clark's American Bandstand, because anything that got played on American Bandstand became a hit, apparently, in some form or another. And um, so he goes to Ellis and he says, I want you to play a twist beat. And Ellis says to him, what the hell is a twist beat? And Bernie responds, I don't know. Just make something up. And the record they ended up cutting that day was The Twist by Chubby Checker. Oh, so wow. Ellis, Ellis plays drums on The Twist, which was eventually a number one hit. Yeah. And then some years later, uh, he also played on Let's Twist Again by Chubby Checker, which was another huge top 10 hit. A lot of twisting. Yeah, a lot of twisting going on. And it's funny because Ellis says, uh, there's, he quotes in that interview, he says, well, all my jazz experience and studies, I end up playing on the twist. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> but he probably started receiving like royalty checks for that oh, I'm to sure. some degree, I'm sure. I hope. I'm sure. I mean, it was, a, yeah. it was an enormous, actually, yeah, you sh I hope because you, you never know back then who, if you signed away, like, do I want money up front or do I want points on the record? Like work for hire right. kind of thing. Right, because. I mean, but it's good to hear also that he's still performing. Right. Because really, we've been going on the like, you know, clinics and the shop and the, the Rogers stuff. But yeah, I mean, cool. He's, Gl I'm glad he's still. Yeah. Still performing. playing. Like he can't do the three hour, you know, yeah. jazz orchestra gigs, but he could run in and cut the twist real quick. <laughs> <You know Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at, at some point in the 1960s, the store moved from 1711 Chestnut Street right down the street to 1725 Chestnut Street. And Bobby had told me that this was their most successful store. And obviously they were there when the Beatles hit. So business was booming that, and always yeah, packed. Here's a cool shot of Ellis standing in front of that shop. That's 1725. They got the cool five set in the window. Music City discounts. Yeah. It, but it's always been more than just drums, correct? Yeah, yeah. Like he's sold other equipment. Everything. All right, that's good. Everything. And you'll yeah, see yeah, it yeah, in, yeah. in this shot. And he's he's a little more dressed down here. You know, he's kind of got the polo button up with the with the suit. Exactly. You know? uh, and, but here, it's a, this, this picture is a little grainy, but this kind of gives you um, a taste of what Bobby was telling me. He said every single day the store was packed. Just like wow. this. And Hoffner, Hoffner bases yeah. right there on the right on the closest. They got the Paul McCartney looking bases, which are, you know, there you go. Yeah. Sign of the time. Just a wall full of guitars. And he said that that uh, shelving unit was a suspended shelving unit hanging by chains, I believe he told me. And when I was first looking at this, I thought those were snare drums. 
but those are all drum sets. Those are bass drums with the tom stacked next to him, just from the front God. of the store all the way to the back with drum sets. He said every, a lot of weight. Every day, this this store was just absolutely packed. You know, this was obviously the most successful store. Bobby had worked there, and he said that. Wow. Um, you know, th- actually, this is about the time that Ellis leaves drum playing drums to just manage a, a very busy store, uh, and. He was saying that, you know, any musician passing through on tour always came to Music City. Music City was like the place to the place to shop for anybody passing through town. They supplied the Mike Douglas show with all the gear that you saw on TV. Oh, cool. Um, He said that Todd Rundgren was a regular Stanley Clark, Dower Hall and John Oates. Anybody who was a Philadelphia musician, you know, shopped at Music City and, and musicians from from all over. And yeah. um, eventually they opened another store, a second store in Cherry Hill, New Jersey at 1610 Carlton Pike in the 70s. And then around 1975, unfortunately, the, the 1725 Chestnut Street store closed and they were only in New Jersey. And around that time, I guess Ellis absorbed a few small music stores around Cherry Hill and it eventually ran its course and he got out of the business around 1984 when some of the instrument sales declined. Sure. And um he retired to Florida and got into various things. Alan Fogel was telling me when he would hang out with him, he was really into like animation cells, like oh, buying cool. like Disney animation cells and yeah, selling yeah, them yeah. and became like a, a dealer in that area. Um, but I guess just enjoying retirement and fading from the spotlight. Uh, but in, wow. in, in wrapping up, I'd like to kind of set up a video that we're going to show of Ellis in his mid seventies. Um, his, his health had been failing and he ended up in the hospital and um, while in the hospital, he had an aneurysm and actually flatlined, died Jeez. Uh, and they revived him. Uh, but after that, it left the entire left side of his body with zero mobility and he was basically paralyzed. So when they had got home, his son, Donald, who I'd mentioned earlier, was like, you know, let me take out his drums. Maybe if he sees the old drums, he'll get behind him and maybe work some things out rehab and get some mobility and I actually have a picture of that drum set this is the set right there a white marine pearl rogers drum set with a nice dinosonic of course this photo was taken at um steve maxwell's shop him and ellis and steve were 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 friends and this was sold to steve after ellis had passed um ellis's wife sold it to him under the agreement that he would never sell it so i hope he still has it um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this, I'm sure he does. But th- That's awesome. this is the drum set that he, they brought out for Ellis to rehab. And there's actually a cool picture of Ellis right here rehabbing, basically learning to move again. Unbelievable. Playing his Rogers I mean, drums. Something you love. This guy's a drummer, right? Like to his absolute core. For sure. So that's uh, going to do more than doing like, ex- you know, exercises with stretchy bands or something, right. you know, it's un- unbelievable. You know, and it was basically taken from taken from him multiple times first with the arthritis and then later in his life with you know the losing mobility in his left side so this video shows ellis at 75 years old performing with a big band it's about a year before he passed and a year after and losing mobility and a year before he passed and a year after his left side being paralyzed and not playing drums for for decades it was shot by his son and i thought it'd be a great way to kind of conclude the story about the wonderful life of ellis tolan and in, th- yeah. in that Suzanne Cloud interview, she asks him, um, of all things you've done in your life, what are you most proud of? And he says, first, my wife and kids, and second, my music. And I think you can really, really see that in, in this video that we're going to show in a sec. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we'll end with that in a second here. But first, I just want to say to everyone listening, you know, thank you. I, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. But for you, Anthony, thank you for doing all this work. And putting this all together, I mean, truly, this is stuff that like, uh, again, I've been, I said it in an episode recently, like I've been doing this for so long and there's still so many things to, to learn. And you do research all the time and I'm sure you're learning things all the, all the time. And it's not every day. It's in no way like a thing where you're like, oh God, I, I'm never, you know, like, oh shoot, I didn't know that. It's more like amazing. Yeah. Like, yes, yeah. more we can keep going. So, so thank you for doing this. Uh, do you want to real quick plug, um, I know you said you're going to be speaking at the Shields Classic Drum Show. Yeah. What, what is that April 20? That is April 27th at the Covington Elementary School at 807 Chestnut Street. Coincidentally, Chestnut Street. It's odd. In Covington, wow. Ohio. Uh, it's starting at 10 a.m. 
Poe runs the show and it's named for um, its founder, Jerry Shields, who was a dear friend of all of ours. And it's a great yep. show and it's all dedicated to Roger's drums. And uh, this year I'll be doing a short presentation on Ellis. And then, like I said, we'll have that friend, uh, Poe Shy and us who runs Poe's percussion. We'll have a little friendly debate on the, uh, on who developed the Dynasonic snare drum. Yep. It'll end in a complete brawl with you guys <laughs> yeah. on the ground. A bloody <laughs> brawl. Absolutely. There's like Cab, Cab Calloway and Dizzy Gillespie style. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, I hope to be there. I got to go. I have to go somewhere for work in early April and then a trip with my family mid April, but it's, it's like 45 minutes from me. Oh, like I'd love hour. to have you so, out again, man. Last so year I, sh- was great. I should be there. That'd be great. Last year was awesome. Was. So um, anyway, thank you to everyone for, uh, watching this episode and, um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And again, uh, Anthony, your, your YouTube channel and all that stuff is great. So you want to tell people where they can find you there. Uh, yeah, you can either, you can either search, uh, my name or it's, uh, I also go on, I guess they have those tags now, which is, uh, Rogers drum videos. Yep. Truly like expert level college course kind of like like Thank high you. quality the stuff you put out is just incredible and i i mean really the, to be consistent and have high quality is like is is what is what you got to do nowadays and and you you absolutely do that so keep up the good work there um i'll just i'll link everything in the description so anthony let's hop over here and i'm going to play this clip and uh this will be the end of the episode so once this is over we will we will conclude so anthony Thank you for being here, my friend. Thank you, Bart, for the kind words. And thank you for allowing us to celebrate the life of Ellis Tolan today, man. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. So here is Ellis Tolan when he was 75, 75. one year after the, you know, the, when he lost the, the mobility mm. and one year before he passed away. Correct. 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 Okay. And, and last, last thing. Thank you to Ellis Tolan's family. Totally. For providing you all this stuff, because I think it's incredible. And I guess, you, like you said, you guys have become friends. Sure. So it's just incredible. So thank you to them. And um, here is Ellis Tolan. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Bart.